this is going to be a little different style of video. I'm going to show you guys some headlines in the ag world as well as other economic things going on and explain it from a farmer's perspective as well as paraphrase um, so you guys know what is going on. And we're going to jump around a little bit, but at the end we'll roll it all together. In 2022, we had a wet spring here in western Iowa, dry in other parts of the world. Then we had a horrific drought uh, following the wet spring. Every year, concluding planting, farmers turn in their uh, acres planted report, which is how the USDA gets a final acres planted re uh, amount number. But what was interesting of last year was because of the severe drought, by harvest, the number actually decreased, but only the number of planted acres. The yield actually went up. So you go out and you plant. They record the acres that were planted. Here comes the drought, wipes out a majority of the acres. Then harvest comes through, and they know that there's going to be a severe low yield. So some of that grain was chopped, some of it was actually dissed under, some of it never met the combine. So you just delete those acres, so the harvested acres went down, so the yield went up because the remaining harvested acres were better, which ultimately says that you had a very low yield, which probably would have shot the price way up, but they didn't want to record it that way. They wanted to show a higher yield, so they just dropped the acres, which is not what they did in 2012 when we had that drought. Additionally, if you show a statistic from the USDA of the acres versus the yield amount, and you can see the bar graph going up, you're not going to get a very good depiction on true yield. And right here, you're seeing that bar graph on historical yield data. Something else you'll notice by this chart is the last approximately 10 years have pretty much leveled out in yield. Again, with the last year being, well, at least that we know about, uh, falsified. There may have been other years that they did the same trickery. So historically, you've pretty much leveled out. And if you really calculate real yield, you've probably actually had a decline. A seasonal precipitation outlook map shows western Iowa being on the edge of adequate moisture uh, again. And we also show some areas of drought again. Uh, it looks like the guys in central Illinois will yet again have a gangbuster crop, which seems like they always do. As that dry line keeps moving east, it's uh, looking kind of sketchy to me at this point because we just don't have much moisture. Here in southeast Iowa, where I'm at, our normal rainfall is about 36 and a half inches, and last year we only had 22 on our farm. 15 miles away, some pockets might have been a little different story. Well, on our farm, that's where we're at, so you can calculate the loss of rain. CSR2 times 1.6 plus a constant of 80 will give you your yield. On our particular farm, you're looking at about 190 bushels to the acre. Divide that number by 3, puts you at 60 bushel soybean. And historically, on our farm, we have approximately 19 inches of rain during the growing degree unit, which would hit your CSR. Do you bank on that number? Probably not. You probably bank on 80 to 85 percent, which would be your crop insurance basis. In our area, weather is only 52 percent accurate, meaning that the forecast is just kind of a crapshoot. So what's it going to do this year? I don't know. Well, the markets have sure been going to crap lately. 2023 is an inverted year, which means they're higher in the fall and they've dropped in the spring, which is not the normal case. Out of 20 years of compiled data, Usually, April is the beginning month and June is the ending month for the highest prices. So the screenshot you're looking at is historical prices on corn. As I've explained multiple times on this channel, the average, which it may go up for five years and it goes down for five years, but if you strike an average, is $4.35. Well, considering 2020 and previous five years averaged about $3.50, that means we have to be in a five-year upswing to level back out to $4.35. Commodity prices peaked in May of 2022. This is when inflation reached the height and also when the Fed began jacking interest rates, slamming on the brakes of the inflation. And ever since that peak, we have been coming down the other side of the mountain in a decline. When the Fed slammed on the brakes, the dollar rose, but has also been in a decline since. 
the screenshot you're looking at here is a local ethanol plant's bids taken one year apart. And you can see from the prices that when they reached a height in May of 22, if you'd have booked for the next two to possibly three years out, you would have been in great financial shape going forward. The screenshot you're seeing here was written in early 2021 on AgWeb. Farm income to fall. Boy. Looks like they nailed that, ironically, since the article has been removed. And that's what you're seeing a lot lately, is if you want to read something about bearish news, there's plenty of information. You want to read something about bullish news, there's plenty of information. There is so many articles that contradict each other on the same web page, it's outstanding. I subscribe to several different grain company websites, as well as just general economy uh, websites. Uh, different economists, different opinions. Uh, they are very educated people, but at the same time, they probably don't have any better long-range outlook than somebody walking the street. Um, there are certain economists that have made fortunes. Uh, Warren Buffett would be an example of that. Right now, you're hearing this big buy gold push, and we're, our dollar is going to devalue, and we're going to lose our reserve currency around the world. I personally don't think we will. I think that the dollar will have its day, but I don't think that day is going to be now. But based on statistics, I do feel that we are losing our uh, worldwide agricultural stance. And in this clip, you're seeing the US dollar index over a one year spread, the rise and fall. Um, you can see when they began quantitative tightening, how we rose but then have since declined. Has it hit a bottom and will it bounce back up? I don't know, but if you strike a line on the top and the bottom, you can clearly see that we rose. Uh, it always goes up and down just like grain markets do or any markets do, but we did rise and we are in a decline. It's just hard to tell where we've hit the bottom and we're going to actually return back up, uh, or we've hit the bottom and we're going to stay at the bottom and we're going to decline. Anything over 100, and we've talked about this uh, several times on the channel already, but anytime you see over 100, your grain markets are going to start tanking, or they are tanked, and they just don't do well over 100. To really get good trade and to sell a lot of product, which is going to bring your prices up, you really need to see the dollar index, you know, 70 to maybe 90. Over that, you're going to see a decline in prices. And this uh, was shared in previous videos, showed the dollar index versus uh, commodities prices. So if you look at the chart, as you rise up, grain prices fall, and as you decline on the dollar, grain prices should go up. It's an opposite reaction. Uh, so as to why the index is falling, but the grain prices have not went up, uh, could signal other things. Back to the headlines, the debt ceilings a big discussion occurring right now. Uh, everybody's arguing. Um, they'll pass if they're just playing politics. And the last figures I saw was 1.5 trillion, which won't run the government but six months. And they'll be back to arguing for more. The reason we have such a deficit is because we spend more than we make. How the government makes money is taxes. Well, they're not gonna do that, so they're just spending more than they But I do feel that that debt limit will get raised, which is inflation really should all it devalues your currency but really should help grain uh, prices billionaire investor ray dalio made this chart showing four quadrants rising inflation and slow growth would be stagflation which is what we have been in slowing inflation and slowing growth is a deflationary bust which is likely where we're headed and deflationary bust is just a fancy word for depression i personally predict that we'll return to a certain amount of inflation that's kind of how it's calculated inflation during stagflation declines and it's because the Fed is tightening it up and it actually is going to bounce back up a little bit and I think that's where you're going to see a minimal return to your grain prices here which is why I still think there's some potential uh, on the highs which is why I made the videos earlier. I uh, can't say that for certainty but I still kind of think there's some some hope or at least you'll, you'll be able to get maybe seven dollar corn depending on your local basis levels. Radiolo or Dalio actually um, as he describes his four quadrants, he explains during a downturn, 
uh, deflationary busts buy bonds but if you have inflation buy commodities so we're gonna not have very good prices or we're gonna have really good prices because that's the you're gonna be one of two quadrants we're in so hard to say but um, that's kind of where you're at or what, what could cue you in as to what could be coming back to the headlines grain sold to china if anybody's been paying attention to the news lately you're hearing a lot about china canceling contracts and they think that they're actually just walking away from contracts it's really not what it is what it is it's basically them playing the futures board but because of the size uh, and buying power that they have essentially that's manipulation to our markets which um, farmers have a real problem with as well as our government Although the USDA and the Federal Reserve, everybody else does the exact same thing to us domestically, and nobody even says anything about it. Basically, right now, we're about to influence the world with corn. And over the years, China has been losing their production, uh, corn production, although they have gained in um, technology on corn. But they're tying up with places like Brazil that are expanding. So really, they should be buying our corn right now. And now, considering that the price is bottomed out, I don't know why they wouldn't be. Um, although I know they don't really like buying from the United States, they're probably just waiting to tie up with South America when the Safrina corn crop comes in. As of making this video, it's May 1st, uh, right ahead of the uh, potential interest rate hike. I don't believe that they'll raise it, uh, but if they do, I, I guess I'll say I'm 50-50 on it, but if they do, I'll guarantee it's only the quarter uh, point. And as of making this video, we're about six weeks away from the debt ceiling. The Republicans have been wanting to do a lot of budget cuts, except the main budget item, which probably really need to be cut. Uh, they'll never get cut. They just pick little tiny shit out to, to bitch about. And they're proposing like a trillion and a half dollar increase, which really won't last the government but about six months. And I personally could really see um, some inflation occur because of that, but at the same time, uh, while they're trying to do quantitative tightening, so they're feeding the government one hand and trying to stomp our throats with their, with their right foot. It's nuts. And farmers are about to get another check ripped out of their uh, grain hauling here, so uh, it's, a, it's the indemnity fund, in case elevators go broke, kind of works like the FDIC, but out of a semi load of corn expect about twenty dollars to be withheld out of that load and the epa has issued the emergency e15 again joe biden did that last year uh, trump tried to make it permanent under executive orders and got overruled by a court and then when biden got in he, he probably saw the same fate so he did this he issued emergency waivers because the high fuel prices and that that put the year round e15 in and I don't believe it could be overridden by the courts because it was an emergency act or something, something of that nature. But they did get that through, and it seems like that's the way that they're going about it uh, temporarily. The Republicans, uh, they want to strip some of these ethanol credits and stuff out just because, like I say, they're, they're nitpicking the budget, and that was an easy target. Although a few Midwestern senators stood up and said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, so now it's back on the table, I guess. And what I understand this indemnity fund is it, it's gotten tapped out, but I don't know if they invest in the certain things. With the higher interest rates right now, we're kind of sitting on a house of cards because government, uh, auto industries, corporations, these commercial real estates, even farming, has really only done what it was able to do because of uh, cheap interest. And now that's going to be reversing or adjusting. Uh, looks like some things that are, well, they say, you know, the Fed's ride the tightrope um, between the next Great Depression or continued inflation. Going back to the E15 uh, annual ethanol discussion, they've been pushing for this for a while, and so far it just hasn't, you know, you saw Trump do executive orders, you've seen Biden do the emergency things, but so far it just hasn't been pushed through to where it's actually law for year-round. And we thought they were going to get that done this spring, and then the EPA had a, a ruling where they claimed at the last minute they couldn't get it done, and I heard impending lawsuits because of it, and I don't know where that ever went. But the EPA has now claimed it'll be done and permanent for 2024, which I'm having a hard time telling. Is this another case of the Congress can't do their jobs, so they're relying on regulatory agencies to do it for them, which is basically dictating law without any representation? 
or is this another issue? Maybe they don't want grain prices really going up. I'm just having a difficult time gauging the long range uh, projections here. I mean, you obviously got a certain group that wants it. The fact that we have a president shoving through, uh, then it just gets murdered there otherwise is just odd. But then again, it shouldn't be a surprise because nobody could get anything voted through anymore and everybody argues and bitches about almost everything. And for that fact, I think presidents get pushed through uh, on the basis that that's going to be the quote-unquote guy who lifts them up out of poverty and rises them to what they really truly wanted. And Trump, he's going to fight for me. He's going to be the guy who rises me from the ashes. Or Biden's going to take care of us. Well, newsflash, neither one of them are. They're going to take care of themselves first. And despite ethanol being controversial, it's going to be the wave of the future. It's a clean energy uh, it, it's needed. I mean, if you, if you want to be a corn farmer and you need to have more domestic use, especially as we may lose our world uh, trade status, uh, if you're looking for domestic use, it's in ethanol. So if, if these guys, some of these farmers, I've noticed some of them are actually anti-ethanol. I, I, for the life of me, can't figure out why they'd be wanting to destroy the market for their own product. You know, I was in uh, tiling and terracing demolition our work and you know if I went in and I had to make a lot of sales pitches but if I went in and I was like no my company's the worst company out there you should never hire us uh, the other guy's going to do it cheaper and better um, where would that have got me I mean it just doesn't make any sense so anytime you want sales for your your product or whatever you're selling you better get on the bandwagon and promote such products and according to some latest data see the screenshot here farmers are in a decline meaning there's just less farmers Take, taking on more and more acres all the time. But you often hear, will there be enough farm market? See this really neat looking case combine? It's a model 51 and 50 with retro color package. To my knowledge, the 51 and 50 was about the smallest model machine left on the market, basically as a modern day 2377. But ironically, Case IH, which I've shown the pictures before, is working on a big twin rotor to compete with the X9 John Deere. Meanwhile, the 5150 has been discontinued. So I went online and took a look, and it looks to me like cage price for a brand new 5150 is going to be about 550000 It looks to me like brand new cage price of a X9 is going to be about 800000 Considering the X9 will probably run 2.5 times more acres, the price is proportionally better on the X9. And in consideration to what they cost versus the size and scale and abilities, it's just no wonder to see that farming's either get bigger or you're dying. You're seeing this all throughout the ag industry. You saw it through John Deere ditching the six row planter and the four row wides. You're seeing it through the combine sales. You're seeing it on your smaller tractors, no longer available in two wheel drive unless you buy a very cheap crap package. We're going bigger, we're going fewer. So as far as being a farmer shortage, I don't think there will be. Um, there's a lot of competition and with this bigger equipment it takes way less people to do way more so it looks to me like we'll just remain competitive slit each other's throats work for pennies on the dollar meanwhile being exploited by the people who are really pulling the puppet strings now you guys if you've made it this far in the video and a few of you probably have and i get very few views on these kind of videos but for what it's worth, and this is my opinion entirely based off of what I've been watching for data points. So you can either uh, take the advice, find it entertaining, and maybe even if, it, if it's this advice proves accurate, then you can go back and say I've, I've built some credibility. Anyway, I think corn will rally about a dollar to a dollar and a half a bushel sometimes between May and July. Um, and soybeans, I think sometime maybe, they'll probably be a little later, June, July. I think you're going to see 15 and a half, 16 dollar soybeans. I have no clue on wheat, just no clue at all. Um, I've heard the crops terrible. I don't know, I just don't, I don't do wheat. Sorry guys, so it's, it's corn and soybeans. Uh, I think cattle have peaked, but I do think hogs are going to come up. Again, I'm not a livestock guy. Uh, seems to me that China has some swine flu issues which probably will limit soybeans a little bit 
Uh, that's, could bring some hogs up as they want to import more, but I think as an overall picture, our hogs, uh, our production is going down. Um, and cattle, back to cattle, there was supposed to be an 8,800 head packing facility uh, built last time. So it's going to be like Rapid City, South Dakota. And I, I've Googled this, tried to find information on what's going on with it. But the packers, they got pulled in for congressional hearings, got their butts reamed. All of a sudden, the price went up through the roof. They're going to build this new packing plant, give out all this money from USDA grants to build this new packing plant. And so far, I don't think it's been built. I, I don't know if somebody has an update. Please tell me. I mean, I'd like to know more about it. But it just seems to me like maybe somebody lined their pockets with government money and nothing's being done. Uh, nothing's being built. And the packers are back to their old crap of screwing over the farmer. As far as agriculture in whole, I've shown on this channel the average is 435 on corn. I've shown the soybean averages. I've shown the decline of farmers. I have shown data for weather uh, points and potential yields. I've shown historical yield data. If you want to group it all together over a 15 year average, it looks to me like farming's going to shit. It's not getting better. It's actually statistically getting worse. And I think you could pretty easily prove that statement if you check the amount of farm debt. And if you want to check farm debt, you're basically seeing that farmers are borrowing against assets to just stay afloat. Which the long range picture doesn't look real good. Simply put, farming has been in a long term decline. But so has a lot of things in America ever since the end of the gold standard. And history has repeated itself many times before. It's the rise and fall of empires. Now, I've had a lot of younger guys come to me on this channel. Some have argued. I have also do other forms of social media. Um, had a guy I went around and around with the other day who finally, and I will say it's ironic how all these guys ghost when, you know, when I make a point, but I said, if you wanted to start a lawn mowing business, then you could. I could go out and borrow 100% on the mower. I could put fuel in it, maybe hire a worker to help me. Uh, run the machine, all sorts of things, and still, at the end of the day, put a couple dollars in my pocket. Now, if I want to go out in Western Iowa, or where I'm at, go buy a farm. I want 100%. I need to buy all the ground. I don't have any money. I just need to buy the ground. I need to buy some equipment, and I need to be able to make a living off this. A bank's going to laugh you out the back door. Unless you have a niche market or something to do besides mainstay commodities, which in our area is really only corn and beans, I have found no other markets. And I did a multiple open door invites on all my social media platforms to say, somebody find me in their market. Ironically, to date, nobody has. Now, somebody told me to go sell produce. Where the hell do I go sell produce? Do I go ahead and put a store up in the city somewhere and take the produce to that store that I can only fill that store up once a year? Do I go to the local Home Depot or Menards parking lot back into the back stalls with nine other guys doing that exact same thing until the cops come along and throw you out of there because you're selling produce without a uh, some sort of a license and you're on private property? Right? Do I do that? And if I do these things, am I going to make an average uh, wage of an American? Which is, um, well, I could tell off the internet, about $55,000 a year. Uh, that, I'm sure, is sub subjective, but uh, that was what a couple different sources came back with. And I would say that that's pretty average. I mean, if you can't make 50 grand a year, that's, I mean, that's, you're, you're probably not making a whole lot of money if you're not making 50 grand a year. I mean, you're, you're probably starving. So I'm going to turn this last part of the video into a rant. I haven't done a rant for a while. If I do a video talking about this tractor or this planter, I make videos based on the item. Uh, I may talk about installing like a kit, such as a wiring kit or a 
how maybe something performs on our farm now if I'm talking about how it worked then that's my opinion or what I have experienced so there's a hint of commentary with facts you know meaning like reading a brochure uh, there's no no commentary in reading data from a manufacturer now when I make a video like this this is commentary um, I am making comments based off of data points that I have found. A few of you have not figured out that part of my video series yet. Now when I talk about agricultural statistics or show headlines, or I talk about our own farm experiences, that's because I'm in the industry and they can pretty much back up everything with a fact. Now, obviously there's commentary within those facts. So if I were to say something such as, farming as a whole has been in a decline for years and we can prove that through income levels based on a per acre return on investment. That's a fact, that's not a comment, that's literally showing years of data. But when I turn around and I say, no young kid could ever get started in agriculture, that's a comment commentary that is using the factual data points to make a comment however there are different circumstances I mean there has been people contact me saying that somebody gave them an opportunity they were allowed to buy into a farm um, maybe a family member passed it down some sort of special circumstance for all sorts of individuals have allowed a lot of people to actually start farming maybe they were in the right real estate area uh, doesn't matter, but they were able to start farming as a first-generation farmer in the modern era. And that's great. If you have that opportunity, that's great. Uh, I don't have that opportunity. And if you're a guy walking the street wanting to start farming, you're probably not going to have that opportunity. And that's where I use uh, the context as to where nobody just walking around with the clothes on their back is going to start farming. So on a different social media platform, I had this kid I was using the uh, analogy about a lawn mowing business, and I had this kid contact me, and he says, well, yeah, but you won't build up any equity in a lawn mowing business like you do a farm. I, I, I get that. A farm's it's a great asset. I mean, you could buy ammo, baseball cards, farmland, gold, anything. Those are all appreciable assets. But it's not only an appreciable asset, it's a business. And if you have an investor who just happens to have the money around and he wants to have an appreciable asset with a certain percent return, then he can just quite walk out and buy a chunk of ground. Whereas I actually have to go pay interest on it and make the payment on it uh, by actually farming it. And there's other factors too. I mean, there's solar fields. There's some Amish people have saved up money that do different things with the ground. Maybe, maybe farm grain got bought up by a manufacturer or Amazon or something. It's just, there's all sorts of different scenarios that play into why farm ground may be valued like it is. But as a farmer's perspective, going out and trying to expand when this is what you're up against and you're in a low margin business, basically, if you're, like I say, if you're a guy walking the street with clothes on your back, it's impossible. It's just not going to happen. And it's a son of a bitch to do it if you uh, are an established farmer. Now, on certain social media sites, I see these guys, oh, can't wait till this crop falls out of bed. Huh? I told you so. Some of you guys got pinned into $7 corn. You shouldn't have done that. I actually jumped one guy's ass. I see you're right. Nobody should get pinned into any amount of corn. I think you should produce it for free. Nobody can produce for free, he says. Well, then produce it for a negative. Well, that's dumb. Why would you do that? Because why is it that there's demand destruction? Why is it that there's all these problems? It seems like you ever notice a corn, like I said, it has an average of four thirty-five. seems like around $4, there's always this magic bulletin point of corn. Oh my God, corn hit $7. There's demand destruction. There's just, nobody's going to pay that kind of money for it. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. And the cost of your groceries is going up because of, you know, these high order commodities. But if it's $4, magically, it's okay. 
it's just like the ethanol thing. Farmers are the worst people to promote their product. I don't find it okay to have four dollar corn. I think it should be six dollar corn. We should be bitching until we get six dollar corn at a bare minimum. The problem with that is, is it's everything else would go up and match six dollar corn, then you'd need eight dollar corn. And if you watched my previous videos, I explained how everything falls commodities up and they level off as commodities fall back down. As a whole, farming is 6.9% profit. However, it's actually 16% because of government subsidies. Now, if you look at any other commodity across the nation, oil, mining, uh, those are about 10% continuous, maybe 12 on the high end, but they're around 10%. So really, grain production is on the lowest end of the totem pole. The only reason we catch up is because of direct government subsidies. Watching everything else go up, but commodities level out, production levels being stagnant, um, all these things that I've described in this video as well as previous, you are literally watching a wealth gap in front of your eyes. And if you can't see it, then you must be completely blind. Now, a lot of farmers that have Trump flags, they voted for Trump, big on Trump. Let me ask you guys, I wish somebody would put in the comments, why did you vote for Trump? Why? I mean, what was the incentive of voting for Donald Trump? I'm assuming, I'm just going to go out on a complete limb, I'm assuming that you felt that his political views were in long-term ways going to make the country better, uh, bring everything up, and potentially uh, make your operation more money or give you a better way of life. Would that be accurate? Or, or did you just vote for him because it was his, the suit he wore or his hair? Now let me ask you this. Out of the last 75 years, if any, if there's any viewers on here, it's maybe 60 plus years old. Looking at the statistics, the numbers. Have you had a job that's kept up with inflation or have you slipped? Has your quality of life slipped or has it risen? And if it did rise, how did it rise? Did it rise through education? Did it rise through the fact that your job just naturally paid up that much more? Or are you in agriculture and proportionally per acre, maybe you're farming the exact same acres you were in 1950, somehow you're making more money off that ground. If you could get in a time machine and you could go back to 1999, there was a lot of local jobs in our little town. Our little town's very, it's like almost a permanent depression. But there was a lot of local jobs, twelve and a half dollars an hour down at the co-op. A lot of kids I know would get a job after high school, twelve, ten to twelve dollars an hour, and it wasn't great. But you know what? Twelve and a half dollars an hour would get you a house. Maybe not the newest or the best, but it gets you a house, and you could buy a pickup off it. And I'd go down to Walmart, and you could buy a cheap set of sneakers for twenty dollars. Let's fast forward to twenty twenty-three. You and some of those people at the co-op are still getting. $12 an hour. But what's that money going to buy you right now? It's not going to buy you what were bought back then. Now, I made a comment on here. There's a no housing shortage. Oh, I got my ass jumped on it. I'm going to reiterate that statement. There is no housing shortage. What there is, is a house location shortage. In the small little rural communities here of Iowa, uh, northern Missouri, there's a lot of houses on the market. They don't sell for very much. There's not very many good jobs even left. A lot of the towns that had factories have packed up and left, and the jobs that remain aren't paying any better than they were 20 years ago. Maybe some are, but not, not all of them. People are working harder for way less. And that's why eventually they just give up. They say, I can't make a living here, and they get the funk out of town. So you're seeing them pack up, go to the city, buy a house, get the hell out of the local area and community, and it's game over. And then my wife, she'll go to town to get goods or whatever. And it's just like every time she comes back, it's like, well, what else did we, what else did we lose this week? We've lost, you know, we got Casey's Donuts, Casey's uh, Little Delis. Pretty soon it was, well, let's go to a limited lunch menu. Oh, let's get, now we need to get, some location we need to get rid of the, the, the donuts because they're not selling enough of them. They're, they, 
they're not going to be fresh. We got to get rid of the donuts. So they get rid of the donuts. And then you go into the high V lunch deli and we lose that. And then we lose our little our little uh, Dollar General or, or, or Shopco, our little Shopco. And you just keep losing little things. More businesses bite the dust. More houses on the market for sale. No new sidewalks. No new buildings. No new anything. Uh, certain certain dealership now is an auto changing, you know, t old used tire shop or something. The area is it's crumbling. It's crumbling. It's looking like a poverty struck dump. There's nobody moving here. And the census reflects that. Now, if you do take time to comment as to why you voted for Donald Trump, tell me which political theory, because that's all it is, is theory, until actually proven, that you liked of his and what you thought it would lead to long term. I personally, there was a few things I really agree with him on. And this is not a pro-Biden deal. Biden, in my opinion, Biden, in this big surge of money that he shoved in the, after this uh, coronavirus deal, it, 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 just, it was a big surge that basically devalued currency at an alarming rate, uh, gave it to a lot of special interest groups. And that's really what's led to a lot of our just very short-lived problems here. And for most people, they didn't get anything out of it. Uh, myself, I got zero dollars out of the coronavirus. Nothing. I never got a stimulus check. Nothing. Absolutely zero. And that may be something I'm working on. Uh, but whatever. Regardless, uh, the point is, uh, I think a lot of people that were labeled essential, uh, at least they finally had a label on them. That that would be, if you're labeled essential, you're getting you're already getting your back broke carrying the weight of the nation. But at least at least now you had a tag on you that said so. And I guess by definition, if you're labeled essential, that also means the people that weren't are labeled what non-essential. I mean, we didn't we didn't label them, but I guess we just as well by default. And if we were labeled non-essential, then how come they got more money uh, than the people labeled essential? Lipford uh, Farmer, they were labeled essential and said right in the CFAP program that we were supposed to endure half the losses. I don't believe me, look it up. Typical business as usual in America, screw over the people carrying the weight of it all. Now when Donald Trump was in office, we had a trade war going on. Commodities were crap. Uh, Donald Trump had a theory that Americans could have a better lifestyle and he knew that they needed better uh, incomes. But instead of actually just getting them a better income, because there's literally no manufacturing or anything left, and I know he tried to change that, but there's just nothing left in the countries. So what he did was just try to make everything cheaper. So if I can't get you a better job, I'll just get you cheaper gas. But as we discussed in another video, all that led to was commodities producers going bankrupt, which then has a whiplash effect. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if all the farmers went bankrupt and all the land was tied up bankruptcy court, what do you think would happen to the price of food? There are a lot of local people that watch this channel. And I mean, lot. They're like psychopathic closet watchers that won't talk to you in person, but they'll turn the closed captioning on, slap on a pair of reading glasses, grab their note tablet, and analyze every fucking thing in a 10 minute clip. The reason I do YouTube, is because of the good people that I've met nationwide. It's because of those few jackwad people that I really have to be careful what I say and keep the content at some times uh, generic. Uh, it's sad that we've lost our freedoms of speech, but we have. And unless somebody wants to go get a go fund me together and defend mine, and there's just certain things I can't put on the channel, unfortunately. Now, I really don't see anybody uh, financially going out on the limb. And I've, I mean, I, I've proven that when I've openly invited uh, many people who have opposing views in the, in the past. Um, we had an opposing view on anhydrous ammonia, so I put an open invite out to to uh, anybody that wanted to buy liquid in, we would sign a contract under a lawyer, do a three-year yield study, the loser has to pay the balance difference in yield. 
Uh, nobody took that offer. I've had open invites to say, come on down, we'll go to a bank together, do full loan applications for a starting farmer with the clothes off your back. Uh, all these things that nobody nobody ever does them, so that's why I know they're bullshit, because I know that nobody ever does them. Um, when I make videos of operating equipment, my God, the amount of people that can operate it a, a hundred times better than I can. And I'm sure there's some really good operators out there. But the people that can do it way better, I, they've never once filed for a job application. And we've actually put an open invite on YouTube looking for workers. Now, we're not right now, to be clear, but at the time we were, and I, I got none of them. So if they can operate it so well, um, I I pay you $700,000 a year, and you know what? You still won't show up to the fucking interview. That's why I know that people are full of complete bullshit. And I also know that this channel is never going to just magically change anybody but I can definitely uh, highlight a few key points and make certain people look like complete jackasses too and uh, maybe get the think tank going in the process now going back to Donald Trump um, who raising corn and soybeans made a lot more money under Donald Trump uh, probably the answer to that would be nobody as a statistic whole and I bet if you showed taxes and, and that's another thing I could go out on them. Uh, nobody will give me their taxes. Nobody will approve it. Show me your taxes. They won't. They won't show them to me. They have no problem showing a, a total stranger at the IRS their taxes. That's just because they're forced to. So they'll comply with law, but they won't show them to a neighbor or stranger. It's just interesting as can be. And additionally, we have some guys in the area that, and some of these guys, I really like the guys, uh, but they get a lot of land, uh, family and connections. Um, so they're almost in like a constant inflated rate of gain, and it's a volume business, so they're they're probably doing pretty well with things. I mean, proportionally they're not doing worth of shit, because I mean, we can prove it through the numbers, but as far as volume-wise, they're, they're doing tremendously well. So certain other businesses or certain things to uh, get into that that I'm not able to personally get, or somebody walking the street with the clothes on their back's not gonna be able to get into, they're not going to have any opportunity, but maybe this other person's got plenty of opportunities, so they're going to have a different viewpoint than what I or the person walking the street would. So uh, that's just like somebody getting paid $100 an hour and really not giving a flying fuck about the guy making $5 an hour. Not so much on YouTube, but in our local area, there's been a controversial wind turbine debate. The debate started as rules and regulations to setbacks, decommissionings, etc. And then it pretty much just turned into a uh, small group of just don't want the turbines at all. I've said that the turbine companies are a bunch of ruthless pricks who have a screw you, I'll do what I want attitude. But at the same time, I feel like we need the infrastructure in the area. Now, it may not necessarily be turbines, but I don't know what else is knocking on our door. So take what you can get. Now, when you get a small hate group, what happened in our area was they used politicians of their choosing to what they're hoping to get their way. And right now they're discussing nitpicking rules, which is about as far as local supervisors really have the power and authority to go, in hopes it probably just deters any companies from wanting to build here. And you can see the turbines from our farm, they're about 18 miles, and uh, 15 miles away. And the, the wind farm is uh, sizable. Uh, you can see quite a few turbines sell blink at night doesn't really bother me at all. Now a lot of these people get very wound up on social media about these wind turbines so I've been a little bit retaliatory towards them. And it's a it's a cliche but a lot of these people that are anti-turbine there's a dumpy house, the electric fence strapped to the side of the house, pile of tin, maybe a junk car, a blue tarp on the roof to keep the water out, and a big giant ass Donald Trump flag out front. If that is in fact the uh, correct analogy, um, you know, Donald Trump said that he wanted to bring back manufacturing in the United States. He wanted to restore the United States to its former glory, you know, rise these people from the ashes. So all of a sudden, if you took a small town where everything's dying and going away and we reversed it to its former glory of manufacturing plants, this and that, then that goes back to like that 8,800 head uh, per day processing plant, which the best I can tell, nobody wants it around. This not in my backyard mentality has completely taken everything over. Well, we won't build the turbines, we'll just build a hydroelectric dam instead. Oh, by the way, your property is going to get flooded and you have to pack up a move due to eminent domain. Bitch and whine about the eminent domain. Bitch and whine about the wires and the power grid coming from the plant. 
bitch and whine about turbines being stuck on properties. Bitch and whine about a processing plant that uh, would sneak up to town and draw in a, a certain group of Mexicans. And at the same time, if some of these Republicans, they bitch and whine about the welfare state. Well, a lot of day labor jobs are not glamorous, and a lot of labor type jobs are they're dirty. I mean, go work at a processing plant for cattle. It's not going to be some clean thing to town. No. But what I'm getting at here is nobody wants anything anytime ever. I mean, they just they don't want it. They 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 want to go home. They want to live out in the country with their little chickens and shit. But at the same time, they'd really like to have about $75,000 a year uh, base level income. They'd like to be risen from poverty. Uh, nobody gets uh, well, some like their welfare, others are completely against it. Um, they they want you know, their grocery store stocked, but they don't really want to see all the things that come with it. You have to have an energy source. You have to have a, a certain dirty amount of sources to to uh, have all these things. You know, uh, if I don't want a packing plant, I mean, somewhere somebody's going to get it. Then, then they want to bitch that China's got it all. I mean, to listen to some of these people, I mean, they're on the edge of going out in the middle of a damn prairie and living naked. I mean, they, they don't want deforestation, but they want to live in a house that required lumber. They don't want uh, the earth mining. They want all this crap, but then they don't mind uh, turning on their, 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 their lights at night, which is, all, you know, copper wiring. It's just the hypocrisy and stupidity behind a lot of these, these masses is nuts. And the first time that somebody doesn't agree with them wholeheartedly, the attitude is basically to get louder and destroy the opposition. I mean, it almost would it gets to the point where it feels like you would like to, well, I can't ration with that person, let's just kill them. And you're seeing this in a populace, uh, and this is why you have two political sides at each other's throats. I was told on this platform that I'm a cruel bastard because I don't care about anything but money for myself and that, you know, bringing in turbines would just destroy the area. Yeah, I agree that turbines suck as far as the mentality and the corporate structure. I really think they should work with landowners. I really do. But I'm also completely big on helping the local area, bringing new life to the local area. As I talked about losing our our delis, our menus, we're losing our little home resources stores. Our wages have decreased locally. We do not have new jobs here. We do not have growth. The housing market's collapsing. Everything's collapsing around me in these small towns. And this is an industry, it's the only industry that's knocked on the local door that would bring any sort of prosperity at all. I mean, and it's not even very good prosperity, but it only bring, it at least bring a few jobs and uh, uh, some new workers for those jobs and it's just people want to tear it down but it's like I say at the same time they want everything but then they don't want to see anything they, they don't want to have to have anything at all in their lives or associate with it all or don't don't want uh, any part of it because I, I don't know I just the mentality behooves me it just you know, if, if, if the interstate was wanting to come through the center of our farm and it was going to be for the betterment of mankind, it was going to totally make me have to drive miles around to get to an access to the back side of the farm that I used to be able to get to, I probably wouldn't like it. But considering how much better it is for mankind, I would accept it. And I just wonder if I was Donald Trump and I could explain this to these, these uh, certain select group of people and how we need to have these things to grow our, our uh, nation power our nation. I wonder if they'd accept it differently. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they'd still hate them. And I just wonder if that would give them a, a different outlook on on, on the uh, particular politician. I mean, we're seeing all sorts of these jobs in America. They're gone. Manufacturing's gone. Making shit's what makes a country. That's what manufacturing. I mean, any production's what makes a country powerful. And that's how, I mean, that's how we won World War II. We could produce. We've lost 70,000 factories. I mean, hell, now, like I say, we're losing our lunch menu. Tired of losing. I mean, we need to start winning. And 
the hell that was Donald Trump's own phrase right there. But if you want to start winning, you're probably going to get, you're going to have to start accepting things. I see people all the time on the internet. They com they complain about these turbines. They complain about the, the solar farms. They are full energy experts. Yet when you question them as to where the grid goes, what's the rate? Oh, it's a tax deduction, really. Did you did you go crack open Mid America's books and you can prove that, or it's a subsidy, as if it's a form of direct payment? And you know, there we go again. Hypocrisy. Why why is it acceptable for somebody to get a tax deduction and declare something at the end of the year on your taxes, but it's not acceptable? For somebody else to do it. For the two mailboxes for farmers, uh, crap. And they'll and they'll bitch about it. At the same time, they'll have no quarrels about going and getting an EBT card. Here's my point, because this is getting very long. Nobody, and I mean nobody, seems to be happy with their income level. There's always like a never-ending need for more, and that's just because your money's devaluing. It's because your way of life, your qualities have went to shit. We didn't get to this point in America by one political party or another. We got to it by all the politicians that have been here. And it's really the rise and fall of empires, as has happened many times in history. If the cattle farmer wants a better price for his cattle, then he knows he has to have the new packing plant. And the people that don't want the packing plant because it's not in their backyard and they're going to ship it off to somebody else who also doesn't want it in their backyard. Meanwhile, the cow producer is suffering needing that packing plant. Somebody has to give. Somewhere there has to be an adjustment. Just like the power thing, just like the turbine, any of it. All of it. People have to accept it and be willing to give and participate to make things better. People bitch about the direction the country's going. Bitch about the big corporations. Bitch about their pay wage wages and the, and the loss of money and the devaluation. Then they continue to vote in the same people over and over. They vote for people who will give them quick turnarounds or fast easy cash. They'll vote for people who will think that they're going to lift them from poverty. And the truth is they won't. Donald Trump's not going to save you. I'm not going to save you. But collectively, with the right attitude, people could turn the country around. They could save themselves. As for some of these farmers who don't want something on their ground because uh, they're content with their income levels, why are you content with your income levels? There's no need to want more. But how come some of these people are the exact same people that don't want anymore or don't seem like they care anymore are also some of the ones to turn around and bitch about the cost of goods and services? I'm not trying to be an asshole by making this video. I'm trying to just lay it out there that until a large mentality change occurs, the country as a whole is not going to get any better. It's just not. The thought process, the attitude, the lack of, it just seems to me like it's going to get a lot worse. And I think we're proving that through the statistics I've shared here right in agriculture. Now, when I was looking at these turbines and saying, okay, if we ever had some on our farm, I'm just looking at it for a loss of revenue uh, increase. I've shown how was uh, incomes once were uh, in the previous videos and to where they are now. And if you could add something to that ground at another production level, then you would ultimately be restoring your former glory just by something. It's, it's evolution. And if you don't want them at all, hey, that's fine. But then you have really no rights to complain at all about what you're going to get. And the people that are just at each other's throats squabbling. And one person, I'm going to vote Democratic. Well, I'm going to vote Republican. Basically, you just cancel each other out. It's not going anywhere. And you ever notice how these elections are like 51 to 52 percent? I mean, it's a dead split. But you really got a candidate that gave a shit about the populace. You really wanted to work it out. Don't you think it'd be like 70-30? Personally, I'm not for your side. I'm, I'm for people that'll get results and, and people that'll give the, the general public the best bang for their buck, whether it's something you may want or not want, but in the long run, it's as it, how it affects uh, the majority of the people. And um, if you can balance all sectors of the economy so everybody has a slice of the pie and do it ethically, then you're our true winner. So far, we've not seen that with hardly any of the politicians. So if you're one of the local 
people that's uh, watching this channel, you know, maybe think about that and wonder, you know, if you're doing the right thing for your neighbor. Maybe you're just pissed your neighbor off and they hate you because of what your actions are. Or maybe you don't care at all about them. And if you're just going to flat out argue with me on this platform, go ahead. That's fine. I'm used to getting a lot of trolling comments. But uh, I still have not had anybody come forth and uh, put any money you know, where their mouth is. That, that does, that is of concern. You know, I would expect somebody that's really hell-bent on their opinions to at least defend them. And if they're defending them financially, that would be a leg up. I mean, that's really going out there on a limb to defend it instead of just spewing a bunch of bullshit and running off. Anyway, it's tired of losing. People need to start focusing on winning. I think that'll conclude the video. If you enjoyed the latter half of it, that's great. If you didn't, uh, I don't care. Go make your own. I'll talk about equipment and stuff in some upcoming videos and show you guys some more things in this planner, some things I hate about it, some things I like about it. And uh, we'll go back to equipment videos right here.